The year is 1940. The Allies are in the midst of defending Europe from the axis of power, while America sits on the sidelines, unsure if the fascist threat is worth fighting. Enter British filmmaker Charlie Chaplin, who, having experienced the threat in Europe, has fled to America to work on his next film, The Great Dictator. The purpose of the film is to sway Americans away from fascist ideology and garner sympathy for the Jewish victims of the Nazi party. Ultimately, the goal being to convince the United States that fascism is worth fighting against. The Great Dictator has maintained a reputation as a classic jab at the fascist states of Germany and Italy, renamed Tomania and Bacteria respectively in the film. Chaplin's camera frames the fascist ideology as absurd and ridiculous, while focusing the heart of the story on a Jewish barber and his friends in the ghetto. So what is fascist ideology? What is ideology? How does the camera function as an ideological apparatus in this film? What does the great dictator say about fascism, and what does the film achieve in saying what it does? Firstly, a few key terms. Ideology. Ideology is everywhere. More than just a set of beliefs that influence your actions, ideology is the lens through which you see life. It is the central force which shapes all of a person's beliefs. Ideology does not represent the reality of life, Rather, it influences how one interprets the conditions of life in which they live. According to Marx, it is the nature of ideology to conceal the reality of class struggle from our perception and consciousness. How exactly does ideology conceal? Through the Ideological State Apparatus, or ISA. Ideological State Apparatus. According to Louis Althusser, the ISAs belong to the private domain and function primarily through ideology, and secondarily through force or repression. In order to interact with society and act out one's ideas, one must act through the appropriate ideological state apparatus. These ISAs include organized religion, the education system, the legal system, the political system, the family, communications like the press, radio, television, and cultural ISAs like literature, the arts, sports, etc. We'll return to the cultural ISAs later in more detail. What differentiates ideology from the ideological apparatus, according to Althusser, is that ideology is an imaginary relation to real relations which functions through an ideological apparatus. In other words, ideology is a false reality which functions through and is expressed by an ideological apparatus. The camera as ideological apparatus. We can all agree that what we see on TV and movies is fake or at the very least, the screen, what is on camera, does not represent the reality of the situation being filmed. Even in a documentary or reality TV show, the viewer or the subject does not see the realities of production. We don't see the script being written, or the actors being paid, or the lights being set up, etc. In that sense, just like ideology, the camera also obscures the material realities and relations of production in favor of an imaginary relation to the images. To quote Jean-Louis Baudry, who refers to film as a finished product to the extent that it is cut off from the raw material, objective reality, this product does not allow us to see the transformation which has taken place. Baudry argues that since the product of film is disconnected from the reality of what is in front of the camera, the camera functions as an ideological apparatus to reproduce the dominant ideology. However, Egon Hamza argues that since reality is already permeated by the dominant ideology, the role of cinema is a demystifying one, which reveals the inner ideological split, to expose the real of reality itself. So while yes, the camera does hide the process of production from the audience, it also functions to reframe and recontextualize the ideology which it records. So how does the camera function as an ideological apparatus in The Great Dictator? Mainly, the camera is used to depict fascism. And more specifically, the camera doesn't just show the audience what fascism looks like. Fascism is depicted as absurd and ridiculous, as opposed to the terrifying reality of authoritarianism. The focus is on the victims and the consequences of fascism. To unpack why Chaplin chooses to focus on the victims rather than the culprits, let's define fascism and look at the historical context in America during the Second World War. Even though Adnoid Hinkle and Napoloni aren't accurate depictions of Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini, through the lens of Chaplin's film, their characters do accurately represent the core function of fascism. Many similarities can be seen between The Great Dictator and Federico Finkelstein's Traits of Fascism, found in his article on Fascist Ideology. We see a strict adherence to hierarchy. We'd better take the fuse. 
Yes, check the fuse. Yes, sir. The fuse. Nationalistic politics. Anti-democracy authoritarian regime. This tonk! Democracy is fragrant. Liberty! Stonk! Liberty is odious. Free Sprecken! Stonk! Freedom of speech is objectionable. Mythical foundations. The idolization of past art or imagery. Imperialist expansion. I am pleased to announce that we are at last ready to march on Austerlich. Capitalist accumulation through military industrial growth. But most importantly, the scapegoating and violence towards a specific group of people, specifically the Jewish community. We've got to rouse the people's anger. At this time, violence against the Jews might take the public's mind off its stomach. Fascist rhetoric relies on blaming all of society's fear and anxieties on one group of people. And for the Nazis in the 1930s, the scapegoat was Jewish people. The great dictator refuses to depict the Nazis or Italian fascists factually. Instead, Chaplin presents the fictional fascists, Hinkle and Napoloni, as ridiculous, uncooperative buffoons. The fascists are always the butt of the joke in this film, while the Jewish people are presented as relatable. In obscuring the realities of European fascist dictators and focusing on their victims, the film represents the Jewish community in the ghetto as relatable human beings. 1930s America already harbored a certain amount of sympathy for fascist leaders and fascist ideology. The message of sympathy towards the Jewish victims of fascism was radical in America at the time of the film's release. Before the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941s, Americans had a general disinterest in fighting in the Second World War. According to a Gallup poll in 1939, 96% of Americans were against joining war efforts in Europe. In the worst cases, many even supported Germany. The German American Bund was formed to organize German American sympathizers in America. They held youth camps, training camps, and even a rally in Madison Square Garden attended by more than 20,000 fascist Americans. They claimed that democracy would never work, spouted anti-Semitic rhetoric, and were defended from anti-fascist protests by American police officers. Pro-Nazi Americans were not so much for bringing America under German military control. Rather, they held an America First mentality, prioritizing to keep America out of the war in Europe. This America First mentality is nationalistic, and that's a key tenet of any fascist state. Tomenia has the greatest army in the world. The Great Dictator does not focus on the strength of fascists. The film instead obscures fascist reality in order to represent the true victims of the Nazis. The camera in this case does not reproduce the dominant ideology of nationalistic isolationism, which was rampant in America at the time. Quite the opposite. The film's final speech is a fourth wall breaking call to action for any American who was watching the film in 1940. Brutes have risen to power, but they lie. They do not fulfill that promise. They never will. The great dictator frames fascism through the suffering of the Jewish people, and in doing so, invites viewers to fight back and defend the victims of the Nazi party. In focusing on the Jewish community in the film, Chaplin is able to highlight the main function of fascist ideology, the scapegoating and extermination of an entire race of people. Chaplin uses the camera as an ideological apparatus in order to ridicule and humiliate fascists, while also highlighting the struggles of the Jewish people living in the ghetto. The only real characters in the film are the Jewish barber and his friends. Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini are reduced to the unrelatable caricatures and punchlines of Adnoid Hinkle and Napoloni, the resulting effect being that the audience can only relate to the victims of fascism, and not the fascists themselves. By skewing reality with the ideological apparatus of the camera, Chaplin reduces Nazi rhetoric to gibberish while giving a voice to their victims. Chaplin effectively subverts the dominant nationalistic ideology of America in 1940 and reveals an emotional truth, truer than the facts of European fascism. The Great Dictator highlights film's efficacy as an ideological apparatus. Since the world is already steeped in ideology, and recording said ideological world further obscures our reality, Perhaps film is the most effective way to subvert ideology and learn from it. You, the people, have the power. The power to create machines. The power to create happiness. You, the people, have the power to make this life free and beautiful. To make this life a wonderful adventure. <laughs>